Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien, coming to you via Zoom in Maui, Hawaii. If you're on a journey of self-discovery or about to embark on one, the author of today's show reminds us that enlightenment is real and available to every one of us. Her latest book can guide the reader into a deep understanding of the workings of the mind so you can see your patterns, learn how to control your wandering thoughts, and free yourself from suffering. Our guest today is Turiya, author of the new book, Unreasonable Joy, Awakening Through Trikaya Buddhism. Turiya is a Buddhist monk, teacher, and author who, despite living with chronic pain, founded Dharma Center of Trikaya Buddhism in San Diego in 1998 to share the power and freedom she has found on her path. For over 25 years, she has taught thousands of students how to meditate, train teachers, and help people discover the unreasonable joy of our true nature. Hello, Turiya, and welcome to The Pathways Show. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start out by asking, what inspired you to write Unreasonable Joy, and what does the word joy mean to you? Well, I use the word joy because it's different from happiness. A lot of people have an idea of happiness, and they equate that with pleasure, where I wanted to use joy because there is a part of us that is always in this joy state. And that's really why I wanted to write the book was to show people that you don't have to do anything in order to experience that. It's already here. It's just, you need to stop doing a whole lot of other things. <laughs> ah, so it's kind of a process of elimination. Yeah, exactly. Now, you, the joy that you're talking about is not really classified as an emotional state, right? Um, it can feel like that at times. There's the rapture and the bliss, but it's more um, equivalent to a state of peace and um, completeness. And you say that we don't really have to, we can't really attain this. It's not, we can't really achieve it. We need to just let go of some things. So what are the things that we need to, what are the biggest obstacles for joy for most of us? Well, the biggest one is thinking that it's not here, that we're not already experiencing it. You know, anytime that you're upset, um, not feeling well, just stressed out, anxious, um, whatever it may be where we're not feeling good, if you look at your mind, you'll find and be able to point to a reason and say, oh, I'm off because of this. But when we're in a state of joy, of just pure joy, there's nothing to point to. It's just there. Well, that must be even harder for someone in your condition, I mean, with chronic pain. Why, why don't you share with our audience about uh, your uh, physical um, issues with pain? Well, it's been a very, very long road. Um, I was first diagnosed with fibromyalgia a long, long time ago, but I had a lot of symptoms that didn't fit. And then eventually, just quite recently, actually, it was probably about uh, three, four years ago, I found out what was actually happening is I had a, a flap in my heart called the PFO. It would cause my oxygen levels to drop. So I was winding up walking around with hypoxia. You know, your oxygen levels are supposed to be in the 100% to 95. And I would wind up dropping into the 60s and get lightheaded. And then if you try and um, do anything, you work your muscles when you don't have enough oxygen, it creates scar tissue. So because I didn't know, and I was being told to just, you know, exercise as much as I could, I wound up doing some, some damage to my muscles. And in 2018, I got my heart fixed. So that was really wonderful. And now I have oxygen all the time, but I still have, um, they call it dis, disautonomy. I can't say the word, <laughs> disautonomy, 
my um, autonomic nervous system doesn't respond the way it's supposed to. Like my heart rate will be 40s to 50s. And then when I stand up, it'll shoot up to 100. So how is it possible for someone living with chronic pain to be joyful about life? <laughs> because it doesn't have anything to do with our bodies. You know, if you're attached to having a perfect, healthy body, even if you don't have the problems that I have, you're going to be miserable all the time. But because I had already started practicing meditation long before I got sick, and that process continued even when my body was failing, I would still meditate and just sitting there doing nothing, I would just, this joy would bubble up, this um, peace would be there. And there's, there's this weird struggle that happens. It's like, well, no, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be miserable because I'm sick. I'm, I should be miserable because I lost my job, you know, because I couldn't work. You know, I should be miserable because. And then I started figuring out like, well, wait a minute. If I get rid of the, I should be <laughs> miserable because, then what's left? There, there's joy. And so that drove me deeper into my meditation practice. So what is uh, Trikaya Buddhism and how does it differ from other forms of Buddhism? Well, Trikaya Buddhism is kind of this name that me and my students came up with for our type of practice. Uh -huh. I looked at all the different schools that were accessible to me, you know, Big, trying to find a place where I belonged <laughs> you know, to go and study. And what I found was a lot of um, cultural baggage, a lot of structures that didn't necessarily support practice. And my teacher was all about practice before he died. He was just like, you just meditate, 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 practice mindfulness, that's the path. And so that's what I started teaching and then now that I have a group of students, it's like, well, and plus um, when I started in 1998, most people didn't know what meditation was. They kind of heard of Buddhism, but now it's popular. People know and have heard. So we finally gave it a name just so people would know that no, we're different. You know, I had my first Buddhist meditation retreat, 1981 and I've noticed, and that was in Asia, I was in India and in Sri Lanka, but um, I noticed <clears throat> since then that, and I've talked about this a number of times about how if somebody wants to learn how to meditate, they almost have to like buy into this whole cultural package or some um, broader ideology uh, in order to participate with a group that's teaching meditation, whether it's Ananda Marga or whether it's you know, Theravada Thai style or, you know, and uh, I always thought that something like practical American Buddhism needed to evolve. And that's what you call um, what you're doing, right? Exactly. That was actually our first name that we came up with was <laughs> practical mm -hmm. American Buddhism. And it just felt a little too generic. Um, and just the meaning of the word trikaya, it's the three bodies of the Buddha. And what it comes down to in a nutshell is that it's the Buddha is here right now within you. Uh -huh. And it's that simple. And you don't need to learn a foreign language. You don't need to dress in robes or shave your head unless you want to. I mean, those are beautiful expressions. So there's nothing wrong with those. But the average American um, is very impatient. They want to know what to do right now to feel better. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Give me a pill. Um, you know, so this <laughs> there's so much emphasis on meditation and mindfulness, which I guess we might describe as the practical application of meditation in daily life or through our daily activities. But you, all, you point out in the book that the main practices of Trikaya Buddhism are discipline and service. Can you explain right. how they- Well, it's, it's the discipline of getting yourself to sit and meditate every day. Oh, uh -huh. right. I 
this day is better, but at least once a day, because in meditation, that's really where all of this conditioning, all these structures we hold in our mind, that's where they melt. That's where we start to become free of them. And so that's our discipline is to sit every day and then to pay attention when we're not sitting on the cushion to our mind and see where it's carrying us. And of course, we have bodies, so we're going to do something. <laughs> so right. if we practice service, if you think of everything that you do all day long as not just about you, but how can I be of service to this world, to other people, you know, even taking care of your own body, if you do it with the motivation so that you can serve others, it elevates your consciousness. Okay, so focusing on meditation for a minute, um, how much meditation do you recommend that the average person do? And do you recommend guidelines around that, like it should happen at the same time every day, or it should happen in the morning and in the evening? What do you recommend to a lay person, um, you know, to integrate it into a relatively busy life? What, what, what do you say? Well, I would say, you know, if you're just starting out to attach your meditation practice to something you already do every day. So if you brush your teeth every morning, which hopefully you do, <laughs> then meditate right before or right after you brush your teeth, or if you take a shower, or if you have coffee or tea every morning. Um, that way you start to build the, that discipline uh, and your mind will actually connect it. It'll be like, oh, I'm brushing my teeth. Oh, wait a minute, I didn't meditate. So then you'll be inspired to go meditate. Right. And so, and how long you sit in meditation is going to vary. If you have a very strong mind and you can sit for an hour, that's awesome, do it. Wow. If you're just starting off, then sit for five minutes and build up that concentration. It's always better to have a shorter, well-focused meditation than it is to have a long meditation where your kind of mind is just drifting all over the place. Right, yes, of course. You know, I used to teach meditation and I used to tell people, you know, make a commitment to sitting. Make a commitment to sitting still for 10 minutes. Don't worry about whether you're meditating or not. And if, or make a commitment to sitting still for 20 minutes. And what will happen is you'll want to meditate because you've got nothing better to do. So that, <laughs> that was kind of my strategy with myself. I would just say, okay, I'm going to sit, no excuses, doesn't matter what happens. And then I'd do my best to do some kind of practice that would lead to, um, you know, one pointedness and um, an empty mind. Well, so for people, for people who already meditate, what is one tip that you might share with them to help them get more out of their practice? Well, if you already have a meditation practice, then I think what you just said about sitting down and not having expectations mm -hmm. is so powerful because when we've been practicing for a while, um, sometimes we have a very pleasant experience and then we sit down again and we're like, oh, I want to have that again. Right. Yeah. And we get upset because it's not happening. Our, you know, our mind is going in circles or we're struggling with something. You're like, well, why am I thinking of that? I'm supposed to be meditating. So to let go of those expectations and then to really focus on quality over quantity. So if you need to, you know, especially as you kind of approach that intermediate stage, um, the quality is much more important than um, quantity of time sitting in meditation. Now you talk about the ego in your book, and of course that is a, a pretty widespread topic of discussion in, in awareness circles. Eckhart Tolle talks about the ego all the time. Um, so what is your take on that? Because you say the ego craves continuity even when it's painful. So it hides the variations of your mind states from your awareness, 
by creating the illusion that things have always been like this. Now, I've heard other people describe that as the inner child, you know, just prefers what's familiar. And even if it's not working, that's such an interesting uh, concept. So how do we, how do we retrain our ego? Uh, well, it's very tricky because, you know, like you said, the ego um, is comfortable in its misery. <laughs> and so if it's become accustomed to something, then it, it's afraid to change. So I think being very gentle with ourselves and recognizing our own fear and just allowing ourselves to take those baby steps and to um, have a lot of positive reinforcement. Now there's a spiritual ego that we see sometimes, you know, where people make it a goal to achieve perfection or enlightenment or whatever. And I, that's one of the things that, that scares me about the word enlightenment is that people are going to become so attached to this ideal that um, they're going to be discouraged because you know, they're not, maybe they're not going to make it in this lifetime. Should everybody be working their tail feathers off to make enlightenment in this lifetime? Honestly, I think so, yes. Because you're in this body and you don't know where you're going to be born next time. <laughs> right. But I've heard people argue. I've heard a very famous Tibetan Buddhist teacher argue that... Um, you know, maybe we should focus on what kind of incarnation we want. You know, in other words, shoot for the, the better uh, reincarnation rather than <laughs> not expect not to be reincarnated. Well, there is a, a way that people can make themselves miserable trying to awaken to enlightenment, which is <laughs> right, exactly funny. It's kind of a form of perfectionism, right? <laughs> right. So they're, they're missing the point of practice, because if you're doing your practice, you know, if you're doing your discipline, um, living in a sense of service, then that will set you up for a very um, wonderful future life. If you have, you know, if you do have to be reborn, <laughs> but it also um, sets you up for this possibility of awakening. Well, you, so I don't, you, you kind of position enlightenment in a much more accessible way. Um, so tell us what you're, how you teach enlightenment. Well, enlightenment is already here, like I said. Every time that we, and so the quality that we can experience is joy and peace. You know, enlightenment itself is qualityless. We can't even put it into words. If the minute we try and explain what enlightenment is, we've created a conceptual box and it's not that, it's more. Right. But we can experience the qualities of enlightened states, of enlightened consciousness. And that is the joy and the peace that we all know at some point in our lives, we've all felt these states. It might only have been for a flash. You know, maybe we were watching a sunset and there was just this moment of, of beauty and peace. That's enlightenment. You know, our ego really mitigates against that though, because it wants continuity. It wants a fixed solution. It wants a permanent solution. It wants to be happy. It wants to attain a state of eternal happiness uh, that's never going to change, you know. And it's so ironic to think that that feelings like joy and peace are more related to being in the flow and being in harmony with the nature of the universe, which is impermanence. And I think this law of impermanence is just the hardest thing for most of us to swallow. I mean, I don't even hear Buddhists talking about it all that much. It's just like it's such an uncomfortable truth. <laughs> To the ego anyway. Yeah, but from my perspective, it's the most beautiful part of life. I mean, can you imagine if things really did stay the same always, how boring it would get? Right, right. Yeah, I can see how you could, you know, it feels joyful to let go and just accept change. Yeah. To think 
I wrote a book about change once. I'm an I Ching uh, author, the Book of Changes. And I, I, I posited that one visionary new belief that we could cultivate is that change is our friend, that yes. it's not a threat. But, you know, that is, a, that is a spiritual practice right there, remembering that and remembering to use that as a filter uh, when we're looking at our experiences. So I, I've done a lot of thinking about this impermanence thing, but I can't, and I'm trying to make change my friend, but it's not that easy. And then <laughs> that brings up the, the, the thing, uh, the uh, term samskaras, which you uh, uh, define in the book. And can you tell us what samskaras are? Because samskaras are kind of holding us back, right? Right, well, these samskaras are these um, mental formations, these tendencies that arise over and over again in our mind. And it's that um, part of our, our critter brain, I guess you could say, uh, that wants to experience the same thing over and over again because it knows it's safe. We've survived it. <laughs> so we're gonna do it again and again and again, even though it makes us miserable and causes us pain. Right, so we want to be safe even if it makes us suffer. Yeah. That's the irony of it. It's really twisted, <laughs> but. You know, you call it the muscle memory of the mind. You know, these habitual patterns of desire or fear that, uh, you know, what is the solution? How do you purify, how do you get rid of the samskaras? Well, it comes down to awareness, to paying attention. You know, the same way that we learn not to touch a hot stove, you know, we, we learn that viscerally, physically. We touch the stove, and it burns, and we feel the pain, and we pull it away. So with the same thing with our samskaras, if we're willing to stay fully present as we go through a cycle of noticing the mental habit to begin with, watching ourselves, you know, through compulsion, follow through it, seeing the result and feeling that pain. And if we can stay fully conscious through that whole cycle, then the next time it arises, we're not going to be so compulsive about we might, have, we might have learned the lesson a little bit. Right. Usually it takes a few few iterations. Yeah, I call that the hangover effect. You know, it's sort of like, you know, how old and wise do you have to be before you remember the connection between drinking too much and having a hangover and how bad that hangover was? Um, so that's kind of a, a kind of low consciousness form of wisdom, I suppose. What do you mean by shielding and grounding? These are a couple of uh, techniques that you talk about. Oh, shielding and grounding, they're um, wonderful techniques because you probably noticed when you started meditating that all of a sudden you get super sensitive. Suddenly your, your um, whole body feels everything. You walk into a room and if somebody's angry and you can just feel that anger and it's heavy, you... Um, go for a walk through a shopping mall and you feel all the desire just pulling at you. So by shielding and grounding, you can kind of mitigate some of the sensitivity that happens with spiritual practice. Yeah, you know, I think I'm sensitive to begin with. I, um, yeah, Shielding sounds like a very useful thing. And I didn't immediately get the sense of what you meant by being inaccessible. Can you explain that, please? Well, the way I use the word is that right now, how most people operate is they're very accessible to their ego. So their ego is kind of calling the shots all the time. But when you start to practice and kind of sink into your deeper self, your higher self, whatever you want to call it, or your heart, um, you can start to become inaccessible to that ego. And the way I kind of define inaccessibility is 
when you go out and interact with somebody, normally our ego is pushing out. Like, I want this to happen. I want it to go this way. I want this. I want that. But if we're practicing inaccessibility, then we're just open to whatever is. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I love the way that you turn to beauty and gratitude uh, as a kind of a centering technique in daily life. Can you share that? Well, it's the most easy way, I think, to shift your consciousness. And that's simply to just pay attention to your mind. And when you start to spin out, look for something in your immediate environment that is either beautiful or you can feel gratitude towards. Because there's always something. If you're on the road and somebody cuts you off, you can appreciate the color of the car that cut you off. <laughs> These colors are beautiful. <laughs> yeah, okay. And what is, what is the one thing you hope people learn from your book? Um, I hope they learn that you know, joy is unreasonable. They don't need a reason to be happy and to really own that because that will change their lives in so many ways if you just allow yourself happy everything is easier when you're happy well i want to thank you so much there's so much more we could explore but we have run out of time and taria it's been a pleasure uh visiting with you and picking your wonderful brain thank you for being so open and generous with your work in general and i want to be sure to tell our listeners about your website www.dharmacenter.com wow what a great domain name Dharma Center, D-H-A-R-M-A, center.com. So I'm sure people can find out everything about uh, Trikaya Buddhism and, and your work and your book uh, at dharmacenter.com. And for those who may have tuned in late to Pathways, this is your host, Paul O'Brien, author of Intuitive Intelligence, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. And don't worry, you can play or share this interview uh, whenever you want via the internet or as a free podcast. And I'll tell you how in a minute. Today, we've been visiting with Toria, author of Unreasonable Joy, Awakening Through Trikaya Buddhism. And I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into Pathways, which is broadcast and streamed on the internet at www.kboo.fm every other Sunday morning at 8.30 USA Pacific time. And even better, podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, along with podcasts of the last 300 shows we've done, are available for free at divination.com. And that's spelled D-I-V-I nation.com, as well as via iTunes and other free podcast servers. This is Paul O'Brien, reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And thanks again to Turia and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation.